Well, good evening. Um, we started a little three-week series last week um, on Jesus' returning. Uh, I had been kind of moved to do that message from uh, Tom had been doing some worship for a couple weeks on what it would l will look like when we're in the kingdom of heaven. And uh, I was just kind of moved by all of that and the, and the scripture that he was doing during worship. And I started thinking about all that and thinking about being with Jesus and thinking about the fact that he's um, coming back. And then, uh, and just to do a short little recap of last week's message, the, the, the thought just kind of came to me that um, we talk about Jesus all the time in church, you know, uh, we do messages about uh, his birth you know, especially around Christmas time, but we talk about his birth, we, we talk about his life, the miracles he performed, the message that he left us, all his sayings, all his teachings, um, his miracles. Uh, we talk about um, his death on the cross and the importance to us as Christians for our forgiveness of our sins. We talk about his resurrection. God raised him from the dead. We talk about uh, everything he did during his resurrection. We talk about the last thing that he said to his disciples when he went back up into heaven for them to go forth and make disciples of all nations. Um, and we do messages after messages after messages about all that stuff. But um, we don't talk a lot about him coming back. And we don't, I don't, at least I don't hear a lot of uh, talk, you know, within the Christian community about that or or even at church, you know, might get mentioned sometimes, you know, but uh, I just don't see us doing it much. And that, that kind of bothered me, and that made me think about, you know, we need to, we need to talk about that, and we need to look at that. Um, if, we, um, if we believe that our Bible is absolute truth and it's the Word of God, um, then we can't help but to believe that He's coming back, because these are the statistics I gave last week. Um, there's 1,500 passages in the Old Testament, 1,500, that refer to Christ's second coming. One out of every 30 verses in the Bible mentions the subject of either Christ's second coming or the end times. In the New Testament, there are over 300 references to Christ's second coming. 23 of the 27 New Testament books talk about Christ's second coming. In the New Testament, there are seven times as many references to Jesus' second coming as there is to his birth and his first. There's seven times more teachings about his second coming than there is of his birth. And Jesus said... I'm coming back 21 times. Just with those statistics in mind, um, and, and just those facts in mind about what, what Scripture, what, what God's Word has to say about Christ coming back, He's coming back. The King is coming. Um, last week we, we talked about, you know, what, what is the purpose of His second coming after looking at some of that. And... Um, his first coming was to bring redemption into the world, and his second coming is to bring judgment on the world. And I think that's one of the reasons we don't talk a lot about his second coming. You know, the Scripture says when Jesus comes back, he's going to separate those to the right and those to the left as to those who knew him and those who didn't. And Scripture says those who knew him are spending eternity in his kingdom, and those who didn't aren't. And when he comes back, there's a finality to things. The second Jesus returns, this world, as we know it, is over. It's done. It's completely done. And it's gone. And there's a finality to that. And that bothers us some. And uh, you know what I mean? I, you know, in, in my own spirit, you know, I, I feel that some. And I think... I think other people do too, you know. There's some wonderful things and some beautiful things of this world that, that we like and we want to hold on to, you know. There, there are also some things maybe that we're holding on to that aren't good for us that we should be seeking freedom from anyway, 
from Jesus, but we're still holding on to them. You know, and, and when Christ returns, all, all of that ends. Um, so then uh, we talked about the fact that we need to be ready. And I just don't think we're ready. And we're not ready for two reasons. We're either holding on to something, and we want Jesus to return, just not today. You know, we're holding on to something. We're holding on to what something we're going to do next Saturday, you know. He can come after next Saturday because I got this thing, you know. But we're holding on to something. Or um, why we're not ready is because we have friends, family, uh, co-workers that we know don't know Jesus. And um, his returning ends any opportunity that we have to tell them about Jesus or to help lead them into spending eternity in the kingdom with us. Um, and I'm in that boat. I'm in that boat. I have people, I have close people that I know don't know Jesus. Um, and we put off uh, those invites to church and we put off witnessing for lots of reasons. We do it sometimes um, just because we've invited a few times and, and we think we're bothering the other person. And we talked last week about we, we need to be a people that love people way past that. <laughs> if we feel we're bothering them, so what? <laughs> ask them to church, ask them to church, ask them to church, ask them to church, tell them about Jesus, tell them about Jesus, tell them about Jesus, tell them about Jesus. If, amen. If you start showing up at their house and they're locking the door and closing the blinds and going back, so what? Go back the next day. People's eternal destiny is at hand. Whether they understand that or know that or not, we do know and understand as Christians. If we've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, we, we, we know the ramifications of that, and we need to love people past thinking that we're bothering them. So that was last week's message. Um, this week's message um, is uh, going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk about when is Jesus coming back and what are the signs to that. Um, when is he returning would be the uh, perfect next question to last week's um, message. And scripture is very clear on that. Matthew 24, 36 says, No one knows the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven or the Son. Only the Father knows. But Jesus has told, told his disciples to keep watch and to look for the signs. So we're not, um, we're not sure of exactly when he's coming back. He makes it very clear that no one other than the Father in heaven knows. But he's given us um, some information in Scripture of things that he's told us to watch for. And that's what I want to look at tonight. We're going we're gonna to go to Luke 21. It's Luke 21. Uh, we're going to do... Uh, verses 8 through 19. We're going to read verses 8 through 19, and then we're going to read 25 through 28. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you don't have a Bible or if you need a Bible, there's some in the baskets underneath the seats, and if you need one to just keep and take with you, um, please, by all means, uh, take it with you. But Luke 21, starting in verse 8, says this. And um, uh, this teaching right here is is as a direct question um, that the disciples have given him. Jesus has talked about the fact that he's leaving and everything, and the disciples have asked him, um, when will these things all happen, and what are the signs that they are about to take place? And Jesus replied, Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened, these things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. 
But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. If we move down to uh, verse 25, he says, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the, what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. <clears throat> so I wanted to look at um, all of the signs Jesus told us to be looking for. Um, he mentioned a lot there of what was going to take place and what we should be looking for, for signs of his coming back. Um, first thing that he talked about was he said that there would be wars and revolutions. Nation will rise against nation. From 1870, it's going back a ways, from 1870 to 2001, wars and conflicts throughout the world have increased by 2% each year. 2% each year for the last 130 years. And that's not to mention the rise of terrorism. Jesus says to be on the lookout for earthquakes. There will be earthquakes. From 2004 to 2014, there have been an increase each year, each year, over that 10-year period of time. Each year, there's been an increase of earth earthquakes that have taken place in the world. Each year. He said there will be famines. 3.1 million children die each year from hunger in the world. 3.1 million. Over 1 million children under the age of 5 die in this world we live in each year from hunger. He said there will be pestilences to watch for that. In 1980, doctors noticed... Um, an ailment and an illness that patients they were getting in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco uh, in the gay community that the uh, ailments and um, problems they were having were all the same came to be known as the AIDS virus, HIV. Um, from 1980 till today, 78 million people have been infected with the AIDS virus, and there's been 39 million deaths in the world from the AIDS virus. Hasn't been that long ago we were glued to the TV sets watching all of the uh, news broadcasts about the Ebola, Ebola virus in West Africa, has it? That began in March of just this year, and from March of this year to today, there's 23,000 people infected by the Ebola and 11,000 deaths, 11,000 deaths in the last six months from the Ebola virus. Jesus said there'd be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Joel 2.31 tells us that the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before Jesus is coming back. <coughs> um, he's referring to, at least I believe he's referring to what we call a blood moon, 
Um, blood moon is when there's a full eclipse of the moon, lunar eclipse, and it takes on a reddish hue. Um, right now we're in a period of time that's called a tetrad, and what that means is that um, we are in a period where there is four consecutive fuller lunar eclipses, four consecutive blood moons. Um, it's happened eight times in history that we know. So over several thousands of years, it's happened eight times. So it's not a first, the time that it's happened. Um, but one thing that's interesting of what's going on right now with it is the four lunar eclipses uh, that we're in the middle of are coinciding with four major Jewish holidays. Uh, the first happened April 15th, 2014. The lunar eclipse, blood moon, happened on Passover. Then the second one occurred October 8th, 2014, which was the Jewish holiday for the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the Jewish holiday where they celebrate the harvest in the fall, uh, where they get together, they don't work, they, it lasts a week. They celebrate the fact that God's goodness has been upon them and they have the harvest and they have their food. Um, the third consecutive lunar eclipse occurred April 4th of this year, 2015. Again, it fell on Passover. Um, the fourth one in this series of four consecutive full lunar eclipses, four consecutive blood moons, is taking place next month, September 28th, which happens to fall again on the Jewish holiday, the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and it's not the first time that we've had four consecutive full lunar eclipses that has fallen on four Jewish holidays. The last two times that it happened, the first time that was in 1948, which was the year that God brought the nation of Israel back and gave the land back to his people. Second time was in 1967, and it was at the conclusion of what's been come to known as the Six-Day War, when all of Israel's uh, neighboring countries attacked them all at the same time. And uh, I believe there was five nations that attacked them um, without warning, and Israel defeated and got full surrender from all five nations in six days. God's hands always upon them. So two major events in uh, Israel's history occurred the last two times that we had the four consecutive blood moons. I'm not trying to say to you that Jesus is coming back September 28th. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but I'll be talking to you in October. We'll see if something doesn't happen with the nation of Israel. Jesus also said, there will be roaring and tossing of the seas. The United States Emergency Disaster Database tracks tsunamis, floods, hurricanes, and typhoons. We've had an increase of these each decade since 1970. In 1970, there was 78 such disasters. In 2004, there was 348. <coughs> um, Daniel 12.4 says that as the end days approach, knowledge shall be greatly increased. I don't know about you guys, but the last 15 years, 10 years, 15 years, um, technology in the world and in our country has just gone past me, you know? I, you know, I, I don't even know how to work a smartphone. I, I own a dumb phone, and I, al and I always will. I'll never have a smartphone. I don't know. I don't hardly know how to do anything on computers, I, you know? I mean, I can remember, I'm 55, I can remember, um, I can remember 20 years ago not even, you know, having or knowing what a cell phone was, you know? 
And I remember the first one was a huge big box thing and it had a huge bag that plugged into your cigarette lighter. I mean, it hasn't been that long ago that we didn't even have cell phones. Now there are these little things and you can get the internet and you can watch videos, movies, movies and I, I don't even know what all they do. They probably make toast. But, um, you know, I, I don't know where all this technology has come from and where it's all going. I mean, if I go back all the way to just being a young boy, I mean, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, we had a, a black phone that hung on the wall in my kitchen that you put your finger into these little rotary dial things and turned the numbers to place a call to somebody, and it was hooked to a cord that far, and that was it. There was no answering machine or, or nothing else. There was a little stool that sat there next to it. The TV in the living room was black and white. It had three channels, and there was no such thing as a remote. I mean, I can remember that. That was not very long ago. And Daniel says, as the end days approach, watch for the fact that knowledge shall greatly be increased. Wildfires in our nation have doubled in the last 30 years. I know that's been a big thing in the news lately with everything going on in Washington and California. Wildfires have doubled in the last 30 years. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, in, As the end days approach, the people will have a love of money and self above God. We are very, very, very much a self-centered, self-seeking uh, people country, nation, world. Um, we want what we want, and we want it now. The Bible says that uh, as the end times approach, there will be made a, uh, basically a cashless society. One monetary system will take over in the world. And... Um, I don't know about you guys, but um, I don't see cash very often. Do you guys use cash? We're becoming a world without cash. You swipe your card for everything. You know, I very rarely um, ever have any she money anymore. For those of you that most of the guys know, but for those of you who don't know what that is, that's some money that she don't know I got. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Used to, have, used to have a little bit of that from time to time in my wallet, but I don't see cash. don't have cash anymore. Nobody has cash. We're becoming a cashless society, which is supposed to be one of the signs. And just a few other things that I wrote down that aren't listed in, in Scripture, but some things that I know God's probably not happy with. The divorce rate in 1929, and I went to 1929 because that's when my dad was born. The divorce rate in 1929 was 4%. 4% of people who got married got a divorce. Today it's 51%. There's fifth, there, I shouldn't say there is. There was 50 Seven million abortions last year in the world. That's million with an M. 57 million. We look at the violence in the world and in our nation, drug use, pornography, gambling, legalizing of marijuana, legalizing of same-sex marriages, taking God out of all forms of government, removing the Ten Commandments from all of the courthouses, <clears throat> um, I think our nation is looking more and more like Sodom and Gomorrah all the time. Where, uh, where my thoughts went with this message after looking all of this up and everything, um, most scientists... Uh, believe 
And I believe this to be true also. Most scientists believe and will tell you that a lot of the things that we have going on um, in the world today is as a result of global warming. Basically, global warming is um, the emission of greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, from our cars and our factories. That's the primary thing that goes on. We, we, our exhausts put off carbon dioxide. It goes into our atmosphere. It can't leave our atmosphere. And it traps in heat that 50, 75, 80 years ago would have went on into our atmosphere. <coughs> um, <coughs> In a nutshell, it's very brief. That's what global warming is. Global warming's caused the ocean's ten temperatures to rise, and they've risen every year since 1970. In addition, there are rising seas. The levels of the seas are rising due to it heating up, and it, it is expanding, I guess is what you would want to say. And... The polar ice caps are melting at an alarming rate, which is causing the seas to rise up as well. And the warmer temperatures of the seas and the oceans is making the typhoons, tsunamis, all of the hurricanes, all of the tornadoes. All, it, it, it's creating for volatile situations and, and making whatever storms that we normally typically would have, much more volatile. Um, the famines and droughts, a lot of those are as a result of our global warming also, and the crops can't grow. Um, the wildfires, droughts are caused by the wildfires with the temperatures being hotter and things much easier to, uh, to catch on fire. So a, a, lot of, a lot of the signs that Jesus has told us to look for, that I have told you uh, the statistics of, how they're all growing at such an alarming rate, um, a lot of that we can attribute to... Uh, the fact that we did it ourselves. And where I'm leading with that is just this. Um, I think for most generations of people leading up to right here and now, um, other generations of people just thought that God would at some point in time want to send Jesus back and want to end this world as we know it. So God would just all of a sudden say, okay, it's time. He'd wave his hand, and tsunamis would start, and hurricanes, and there'd be a drought, and famines, and things, and God would control it all and make that all happen to fulfill the signs leading up to him sending Jesus back. God, being the all-knowing, all-powerful God, this is just my take. I think he knew, given enough time, we as a people, we would foul this planet up. I think he knew we would. I think he knew eventually we would foul everything up and we would cause all of these things to happen and all of these things would happen and then he would send his son back. Um, take take my, uh, my words and my stats for whatever you want to take them for, but I'm telling you, the king is coming. He's coming. And we need to be ready. We need to be ready individually in our hearts. Scripture says that if you uh, profess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved.
we need to be ready as individuals. We need to be saved, and we need to take the God's word and God's message and the message that we have of uh, salvation in Jesus out to everyone else that we know that doesn't know Jesus. And we need to do everything that we can to reach everyone that we know and love and pass that message along because the king is coming. And much like that video we were watching, there's not going to be an announcement. It's not going to be on CNN where they're going to say, hey, it's going to happen in three weeks. Or it's going to happen in three months or three years or whatever. There'd be no, no warning, none whatsoever. And it's just going to happen in the blink of an eye. But Jesus has told us to watch for these signs that we were looking for tonight. And, and I want to close tonight's message just with saying this. Um, we need to become a people that want him to come back and can't wait for him to come back. Not a people that are afraid of him coming back or wanting to hold on to things of this world. I, I look at my own life, and you guys have all heard my testimony a million times, and my life before being a Christian was filled with pain and hurt and sorrow and suffering and anger and frustration and stress and failure and guilt. Um, I had... Uh, I, I, I had addictions to pretty much everything that you've, they've, you've ever heard that they make a 12-step program for. And that's the truth. And um, when Christ came into my life, he removed all of that. And he replaced my life with love, joy, peace, forgiveness, With that change that he's done in my life here on this earth, how can I not want him to come back and to be with him? What is that going to be like? How can I possibly be holding on to anything of this world? 